You're listening to MedEx, the Medical Extrusion Podcast, presented by U.S. Extruders. Extrude with confidence. Custom extrusion equipment designed for you and your application. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the MedEx Podcast. Today's guest is Damian Carr, founder of IDEA MedTech Consulting based in Galway, Ireland. IDEA provides catheter shaft and delivery system design, and they train engineers worldwide on emerging catheter technologies. Enjoy. Hey, Dane. Nice to, nice to have you on the podcast. We've been uh, trying to get together for probably over a year now, so it's finally good to have you on the podcast today. Got it eventually. Good to be here, Steve. Yeah. Great. Uh, Damien, but before we get started, we have some really interesting topics to discuss. But before we do that, it'd be good to give our listeners an overview of your background and uh, idea consultancy. Absolutely, Steve. So my name is Damien Carr, and I'm a catheter designer, expert and specialist and educator. So I've started a company called Idea MedTech Education, and we essentially give workshops on how to build, design, manufacture catheters from start to finish, what materials you can pick, what processes you can do. And to give a little bit of background myself and how I got into it. So interesting little story when I was 11 years old. I got diagnosed with a thing called tuberculosis, which unfortunately rotted away the bottom right half side of my lung. And I overheard doctors telling my parents at the time that I might have a life expectancy as short as 50. Now, unfortunately, parents didn't really know how to come and talk to me about that. And I didn't, and knowing that I caught this over a secret, I couldn't really go and talk to anyone. So I was a creative little child and thought, I like making things, I can make something to fix myself. So I didn't really like the idea of open lung surgery at the time, so kind of veered towards the non-invasive route. And many years on, I've essentially just been chasing that passion and chasing that kind of attitude for, for survival, if you could say it. And I don't think I'm getting around to the whole non-invasive lung transplant as it is. So I decided to start training and educating other people in the industry so that hopefully when some other 11 year old boy with a crazy dream and a little bit of a timeline comes into play that he'd be able to create and produce the medical devices that he needs to get there or she. Uh, so that is actually what passioned me and what drove me into this kind of line of education. And it's just taken off ever since. Wow, that's a great story. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. Damien, I know we're going to talk about some emerging catheter technologies uh, in our mm -hmm. discussion, but before we do that, let's kind of set the groundwork and, and just kind of go over the, the construction of a multi-layer or composite catheter shaft. Absolutely. So to break it down simply, there's three main layers. You have your inner liner, your lubricious layer. So this is essentially like the veins or the arteries of the device. Stuff goes inside, it has to pass with very, very little space. You're talking about less than a human hair in spacing. So very, very low friction um, that you can pass the device. The second layer up is the reinforcement layer. So this is like the bones of the operation. And just like your bones, you need some places that aren't flexible, and then you need other places that can articulate well and flex. So we often use either braiding, coiling, or laser cut hype tubes, and this is able to give us really stiff sections in some parts, and then really soft sections in the other parts. Now, if we put this into the body at this stage, it's pretty much a cheese grater for the inside, so it's not too uh, advisable. So what we have to do is we have to put a skin on the top of it, and the skin is the polymer layer. So that's the plastic that we melt, reflow, laminate in over the top, and that just holds everything together. Now we can do beautiful little things, but like put a harder plastic on the proximal side where we need to push and do good force rotation, and then use a softer durometer down the other side, like um, say go from a 72D p backs on the proximal side down to a 35D on the distal side, and then it can be nice and flexible so it's able to track well and go around that kind of anatomical, say, paths to get to wherever mm -hmm. you need to go. So that okay. is the simple breakdown of a trilayer construct or a composite construct. When you are involved in the design of a, a composite catheter shaft or training an organization, how do you go about, talk, talk to a little bit about the differences in, in an over the wire type catheter design and a, a rapid exchange design? Mm. So the, the main difference between an over-the-wire and a rapid exchange is an over-the-wire, 
The guide wire goes the full way through the whole length of the device, start to finish. With a rapid exchange, it only goes over the very, very distal end. Now, this is typically for procedures where you have a lot of tool changes. So you just need a short section where you go over, pass it in. So you need a very, very short section of PTFE. Uh, and if you actually have enough clearance and you will say lubricious additives into the polymers, you don't need any fluoropolymers at all, bar what you'd actually need to reflow it in together. So they're typically shorter devices, and you have that sky cut in from the outside and a short distance going over the guide wire. Now, the catch is when you're passing that into the, the body, you have a guide wire going side by side with the rest of your device on the proximal side. So it doesn't quite work well for really long devices. So they're short, flexible. You can often get a nice little coil transitions at the distal end to get beautiful little, um, beautiful little kind of transitions into the body. But outside of that, that would be the, the main key difference between an over the wire and an ORX. Uh, and then you can do many things outside of that. Okay. One of the other questions, that was a great explanation. One of the other questions I wanted to ask is, you know, about access. And we see a lot of growth in radial access versus femoral. Can you talk a little bit about just in general design differences between the two access? Absolutely. So working with the environment you're in, ephemeral would be down kind of near the groin where you're getting access. It's a much bigger, much bigger introduces that tip be used because you have more space, but you have a longer distance to go. So these are typically long devices, could be two meters long, and you would have a, you'd need quite a stiff section on the proximal side because you want force translation to go through. So you have more OD that you can play with, but you need a little bit more stiffness to get the whole way up. Where if you go radially, which is in around the wrist or the arm, you need a shorter length, but you need to be more flexible and you need a lower OD because there's less space to go in. So typically you kind of vary over towards coiled catheters, or sometimes you might have to, rather than use say, a 16 wire braid, you could jump up to a 32 wire braid. Then you can use more wires in more wires, thinner wires, and take up less space so that you're making a narrower wall thickness of a device. Uh, for similar. So you do have to increase that kind of reinforcement capabilities and you'll have to play and kind of zone in with your polymer layer on the outside too because you have a little bit less space to work with when you're going radially versus femorally. Okay, excellent. So we kind of went over the, the basic construction of a multi-layer or composite catheter shaft that mm -hmm. maybe you'd see in a, a balloon catheter, angioplasty. Talk to, a talk to us a little bit more about you know, some of the more modern uh, delivery systems that have articulating uh, distal ends or steerability. Mm. So if you were to imagine a profile end of catheter, if you're picturing a balloon catheter, you have your main big lumen, that's for a tool path or for going over the guide wire. And then you have your small little satellite lumen, and that is to inflate the balloon. Now, with a, ver with a steerable catheter, it works very similar. You have your big lumen and you have your small lumen, which you put a pull wire in. When you pull that pull wire, you're making one side of the catheter shorter, so it ends up folding and bending on one side. Now, the only, well, lots of differences, but the key difference between them is the location of that second lumen. When you're doing a steerable catheter, you put it underneath the braid, so when you put tension on, it's not going to rip through the plastic on the outside. When you're doing a balloon catheter, you put it outside the braid so that you can easily drill or skive or access it to make your inflation holes to inflate the balloon. So it's just location, location, location. Okay, interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Now that we've kind of set the, set the stage for more modern uh, catheter designs with steerability, how do you approach when you're working with a client on the design or training a, a steerable, robotically driven catheter? It all has to kind of get based down to what the anatomical model is or what the anatomical needs are. So that tends to be a big driver and it can work very different if you're going radially, clavenly, femorally, whatever single axis point you get, you're trying to create it within the limitations of that. So the closer to the heart you start, depending on the area, the bigger of an access path that you have, so the more scope you have to work with. Now, a lot of the robotic-driven catheters at the moment tend to, like, 
the Da Vinci catheters tend to work with straight, stiffer percutaneous catheters. So we're not really at the point yet where the robots have enough capability to use long steerable devices. This tends to be quite a tactile thing. So for the moment, it's very hands-on surgeon devices that will be working with the robotic steerable devices. One other topic on, on sort of next generation, you know, image guided or CT scan, what, what can you talk mm -hmm. about how you approach the, those um, applications with your clients? So a lot of our drive at the moment with medical devices is kind of procedural outcome and success, where later on in the future, once we have kind of gotten a good grasp on this, there are going to be a lot more patient-centered uh, drive or mm -hmm. patient-focused drive. So this is going to mean less radiation, shorter surgery times, moving from femoral to radial, because if you get something in your arm, you can walk out that day. It's not going to affect your ability to get up out of the bed. If you get something in femoral, they're going to keep you in for a day or two extra just to make sure it's healed. So the devices are going to get a lot smaller, shorter if we're going in these kind of paths. We're also going to change the imaging. So typically we're using CT scans. This is inevitably going to go to the likes of cone beam CT scans so that you're going to be able to get a 3D image of the person in situ. Surgeon's going to be able to, able to wear glasses and actually look inside your body while you're on the table. And then we're going to mix that with uh, other things like MRI. So we'll be able to do a CT and an MRI connected together, which means that we'll have to have non-metallic catheters. So mm -hmm. we'll have to replace the braid with, say, LCP or some polymers in place of it. Uh, we can also at the moment use cone beam CT scanning with ultrasound scanning. So we're going to have to start developing some better ultrasound coatings to be able to play on, on devices. And then there's some beautiful little features like sensors or navigational features that we can incorporate into catheters. And this just means that the surgeon doesn't have to depend on using x-ray or pumping contrast media into you to know where they're doing and what they're doing or where they're at and what they're doing. So this is going to have a massive influence on how we end up designing the catheters. Along with one of the big crazes that I think will be coming up is the integration of sensors into catheters itself. So that's going to, especially with the MDR, and it's going to be a lot more kind of influence on collection, collecting post-market data and research. And this is obviously going to have a big impact on how you're de designing your next generation products. And then later, later down the line, we'll have a beautiful thing called direct laser, write, direct laser writing, which essentially is using a laser to write graphene paths inside the walls of the polymer in the catheter. And we can write paths so that we'll be able to see is there a temperature change, is there pressure, is the pH level changing inside your blood, what the flow is. So we'll have these invisible sensors built all the way along our devices to do incredible things. And the more data that we can collect, the better we can analyze future procedures and even create more kind of um, desirable devices that will be working with AI, robots, or whatever else. So the less risk, the more reward. Wow, amazing. That was great. Thanks, Damien. Back to the point that you made about MRI and, and MRI compatibility with the reinforcement, you know, metallics uh, materials are, are kind of a no-no, right? I know that was a, a, there was a lot of talk about that over the years, over the last couple of years. Have you seen anybody kind of implement some of these MRI compatible reinforcement materials? Like, a, like you said, LCP, maybe a peak or other, I mean, especially I'm wondering, you know, how do you do that with a hypo tube? Are there uh, compatible metallic, you know, metal materials that are MRI compatible? I wouldn't be too safe. There is definitely uh, metallic about metal materials that are compatible. Nitinol is often used, I believe, mm -hmm. but I think it's it was used, but now it's considered high risk. So anything that could have any sort of iron content in it is then being removed. But we are creating better and better polymers all the time. So I believe Zeus have LCP, liquid crystal polymer. And at the moment, we're typically using, say, 16 wires from abrading catheters. How I envision this moving in the future is that we're going to be getting down closer to, rather than braiding, it's going to be like an electrospun spun polymer wire. So we'll be able to put in 128 uh, wires that are maybe three or four times the thickness of spider silk. 
and be able to wrap these around in such a way that once we bond the polymer over that, it's going to create the same effect that we're getting with um, currently using stainless steel braid. Wow. Other things we can do is direct laser writing, that beautiful technology I talked about earlier. If you write a graphene path, so it's essentially a carbon path inside a polymer, it's 100 times stronger than steel. So we could actually just write our own braiding patterns into catheters. Now this is 20, 30 years in the future when we get mm -hmm. to this level. But that way we'll be able to take away any sort of reinforcement layer that's automatically in it and post-process reinforcement layers in. Um, so that's going to be able to turn just a standard polymer tube into something absolutely miraculous. Yeah. Wow. Very interesting. Now, as we talk about these emerging technologies and therapies, steerability, robotically driven catheters, what are some of the capabilities that contract manufacturers need to be able to support these new, you know, emerging therapies beyond extrusion, braiding, and reflow? Are there certain capabilities that like contract manufacturers need to kind of bring in house to support these technologies? So if you're to look at the difference between an automotive manufacturing industry and the medical device industry, the automotive industry is much far beyond where we are at the moment because they're trying to cut down milliseconds on a process to get the amount of units out per hour or per minute or per second. When you're talking about medical devices, we often make these in R&D using R&D capabilities. So they're quite bespoke crafted items. And then we're just passing that on to our manufacturing. So at the moment, it takes a long time in comparison to what we could do. So one of the big thing contract manufacturers are going to start picking up over the next five to 10 years is the automation. And we're going to start increasing the ability to automate these devices, start doing reel to reel with a lot, uh, a lot of the processes and taking away a lot of the kind of customized high risk, high failure processes. Now, all the processes are there, but they're at a very early stage. We have so much scope in so many areas around catheters that we can improve on that there's no just one thing that can start to advance. But the key one is to automate it as much as possible, to try and get the catheter as far along in the process before having to get hands on and start doing very, very little manual, tedious kind of tasks. So that is going to be the big driver for contract manufacturers. But in order to do that, we have to design for automation. Mm -hmm. so we have to design with this, take away the kind of idea of discrete braiding with PPI changes and trying to influence that in other aspects. If we can get continuous PPI the whole way through and then just change the polymer on the outside or vice versa, variable PPI and a single polymer on the outside. So it's, it's a big part on how we design the process as, as opposed to what the contract manufacturers can do with current science. Interesting. How about, uh, talk a little bit about additive manufacturing and where you see that being used in, in early stage development of these modern catheters. Um, much, much far beyond the early stage. So additive manufacturing at the moment is typically viable up until around 10,000 parts. Uh, so you can get carbon 3D printers. So if you're doing less than 10,000 parts, go additive manufacturing rather than spend the 20 to 40K on your mold tooling. But if we're at a stage in the future where we can start advancing and making new revs of devices pretty early, we can unlock so much more capability and potential with what we can do with other manufacturing. We have less limitations by, say, the top-down and top-up kind of restraints. So in just the handles alone, it's going to lock, unlock capabilities that we haven't even imagined at the moment of what mm -hmm. we can do. In regards to other aspects, we can start 3D printing balloons out rather than having to blow mold them in the current process. We could even, there's an additive manufacturing method on plating metals. So you can actually plate onto your stainless steel or your coil and make it radio opaque, or even plate onto a stainless steel tube and make it radio opaque and not need the idea of having getting a platinum iridium marker mat. So there are beautiful little additive processes that we can already do in this industry, it's just they're yet to emerge the capability where they're all understood. Oh, interesting, especially since you can't get marker bands these days. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, great. That was very interesting to kind of talk about the, the foundation of a multi-layer composite catheter shaft and going to some more modern technologies. Let's talk a little bit about the workshops, the catheter dynamics workshop that you provide and 
and I know you have uh, one scheduled pretty soon coming up, and you're going to do a road show as well. So why don't you go ahead and uh, talk about the workshop and what your plans are? So the workshops themselves, they're typically two days and I have open workshops, which I'm now doing a little bit of a, a tour around the world with. And then I have closed workshops. They're more bespoke for the customers themselves. And it's essentially two days of a extended TED Ed video. So I'm a very multifaceted learner. So I like learning with visuals with pictures or videos. So half of it is essentially an action packed, um, superhero movie for catheters and then the other half is just me kind of getting overly excited with these things now at the end of it because i end up speaking a lot and teaching a lot i put everything into a book so i've created a catheter design handbook and this gets passed out so essentially the workshop itself is like the instruction manual for the book and then the book is what you take in thereafter and are able to go back to it and see start to finish all the materials you could use processes you do little steps on how you want to do it from r d and how you transition to an automated um assembly thereon okay. so ver yeah that's the the essential often excellent and how many have you done so far workshops Lost count. Uh, I'd okay. say I lost Good. count. Okay. Forty or fifty, forty or fifty-ish around this stage. And um, so I have uh, one coming up in Ireland in two days, and then I have another one in Galway in January 2024. And then the aim will be to go over and do Boston, California, and Toronto in either March or April. We're just trying to confirm dates with the, the different venues at the moment. Okay. So you said Boston, um, Toronto, Boston, Boston, California, and then Toronto. Okay. No Minneapolis. Uh, it could be added. We're open okay. suggestions. Okay. Yeah. Very, very I, open suggestions. Over, the, over the years, it seems like uh, many Minneapolis has kind of taken over as the, the major hub in North America for med device. Excellent. Then it's on the list. Yep. Okay. <laughs> great. And you've done, you know, 40 or 50, so you have this down pat by now. <laughs> you've learned a lot through the process. I'd love to say it, but every time I'm still doing a workshop, I'm still making them better. I'm still scrunching up until 2 a.m., three or four mm -hmm. nights, or even weeks beforehand, trying to make it easier to digest or easier to understand, or else I'll see some sort of TED Talk or TED Ed video, and I'd be like, that is a beautifully impactful way of drawing something. So no, I'm never happy with where they're at. I'm always getting bigger and better, and then my struggle is to fit it into the time that I've allocated. Yeah. Do you, do you often get asked to, to kind of go back again? Hey, you came in a couple of years ago. That was great, and you want to learn a little bit more about new technologies or just kind of have a refresher? Do you kind of go back and do it again? Absolutely. Um, most people by the very end of the, the workshop are looking for another workshop year, a year in advance or mm -hmm. yeah, even a lot of the kind of bigger customers. And I do them not only if you're designing medical devices, but if you're working around medical devices. So if you're a supplier, if you're making equipment, if you're making materials, I've done most of the big players in this already, but I do typically one day workshops there. So it's to teach you the language of the catheter designers. So you can understand where our troubles are, what our problems are, and what's the stuff we really kind of want to, to be influenced in this industry. Okay. Damien, this has been a great conversation, very intriguing, and, and especially your, your background and how you got started in this is really heartwarming. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much, Steve. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you today. All right. Have a great week. <laughs> Same to yourself, sir. Take care. Yeah. Thank you for listening to MedEx, the medical extrusion podcast presented by U.S. Extruders. Please subscribe to make sure you're getting the latest episodes. For video episodes, go to us-extruders.com forward slash podcasts. All links are available in the show notes.